Well, good morning, Grace Life. Uh, we are here to worship our King ind indeed today. Uh, we're just so glad that you could join us uh, this morning for our online worship gathering, and we welcome you. Uh, if you're a guest visiting us, I'm Mike, I'm one of the pastors. We want to welcome you to our service today. We hope that you are encouraged, you're strengthened in your spiritual journey uh, towards finding God and knowing God and ultimately resting in Jesus Christ. And so we have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, I want to invite you, if you're able to, please turn on your uh, Zoom cameras. We do that so that we can encourage each other with our participation and our online presence. And we understand if you're unable to do so for whatever reason, but we'd like you to go ahead and turn on your cameras uh, if you're able. Uh, let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer this morning uh, before we begin our service. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you, Lord, for once again, another opportunity to gather um, in your presence, Lord, throughout the city, throughout our various homes and locations, God. We get to honor you today as one body, and we're thankful for that, Lord. We're thankful that uh, you died for us, that you rose again for us, and that you're, you're present here with us, God. And so we honor you, and we lift up our hearts to you, God, as one community, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead and lift up our, our voices together and let's sing unto God uh, a song called Grace is Enough, which just declares that God's grace is sufficient regardless of our circumstance, regardless of our trials. His grace is enough for us. He supplies our needs through Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and worship him together. Oh God, you 
All right. Well, praise God. We thank you, Lord, that your grace is enough for us uh, through Jesus. And um, you're just so abundant in how you provide for us, God. And uh, right now we're going to uh, read Psalm 46 as our responsive reading today. As that comes up on the screen, I want to encourage you to uh, go ahead and read it out loud together with me. Let's read together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Well, as we've been praying as a community through this season, I want to invite us to continue in prayer uh, today over the big issues of our uh, nation, over our community, and for us individually and as families. And so Jesus tells us to persevere in prayer. And so I want to invite us to continue to pray over our nation. Let's continue to pray for God's healing over our land, for um, a spiritual awakening amongst people that they would see their need for God and, and through Jesus. Uh, let's lift up our church, Church Every Day, and our Grace Life community. Uh, continue to pray for our pastors and leaders, uh, the pastors on the KM side, on the EM side, for uh, our education pastors as they shepherd our children. And let's pray that God strengthens his church, his body. And let's also lift up uh, us individually and in our families. Let's pray for our young adults, for our singles, for our young couples, our older families, uh, that we would experience Jesus uh, every day uh, in transformational ways. So let's, let's spend a few moments praying, and I'll invite us back together. Let's go ahead and uh, join our hearts together as one as we uh, lift these topics up together as one body. Father, thank you, Lord, for the nation we get to live in, Lord. Um, we, we pray for its blessing. We pray for its spiritual awakening. We pray also for the, the pandemic, God, that um, you would just bring it to a swift end. You would bring healing. You would also just give wisdom to our leadership, God, whether it's in the national, state, or local levels. Uh, we want to lift up our church to you, all the pastors and elders. We want to lift up every member that you would strengthen the body, that you would strengthen us to be a powerful light in the valley and throughout Los Angeles and beyond, that you would use us as a community of faith. We also pray for our young adults, for our singles, for our families and our children, that Lord, um, every day we would experience Christ in fresh ways, in new ways, through his word and through prayer and just through having our habits of heart transformed, God, that we would experience his life abundantly. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
my childhood was as close to perfect as you can possibly get. But when I was 12, my life changed forever. I, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was completely drenched in sweat and absolutely terrified. I had no idea what was going on. My heart was racing. I couldn't breathe, and the walls felt like they were closing in around me. That was the night I experienced my first panic attack. As I got older, I started dealing with crippling bouts of depression and severe anxiety. I turned to drugs and alcohol to try and cope with everything. I completely hated myself. I, I felt like I was flawed, I was worthless, and I was broken beyond repair. Um, see, in my mind, I thought I had failed God. By this point in my life, I was really, really good at hiding both my symptoms and my addictions. I, I really hoped that marriage would solve all of my problems, but uh, things continued to spiral out of control and I wasn't able to hide it anymore. It's hard to describe what it feels like when the most important person in your world says that because of you, they're, they're gonna have to walk away. It was by far the worst moment of my life and if I was being completely honest, I would have preferred death than the words that came out of my wife's mouth. I finally accepted that I needed help. In my mind, that meant that I was admitting that something was probably really wrong with me. Words like therapy and treatment and psychosis started coming out, and it's a really scary thing to go through. Pretty quickly, my psychiatrist was able to diagnose me with bipolar 2 disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. It's not something that you take a pill and you're better. It's something that you will struggle with for the rest of your life. And that was hard to hear. I still struggle with my disease every day. I still fight it every single day. So how, how can I claim to have peace in the midst of something like a panic attack? And how can I claim to have peace when I'm fighting depression? It's because I'm not fighting the battle alone. Jesus has given me peace in the midst of my own chaos. And I have peace because I've seen firsthand what God can do with the most broken of people because I am that broken person. And I'm standing here as living proof that there is no one so broken and no one so flawed and no one so sick that Jesus cannot and will not heal them and use them to further his kingdom. He is where my peace comes from. He is my peace. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, for some, that's uh, a very personal story, um, and many of us can relate to something like that. And believe it or not, we are at week 51 of our online service, meaning next week will be 52 weeks of being online uh, in worship, and so a full year. And there are things that um, have been not necessarily been addressed uh, whether it be by the universal church, uh, whether it be um, as you as individuals. And so today, as we talk about uh, our series in the habits of the heart, uh, we're going to talk about um, a habit that helps us in the midst of anxiety and, and stress. And uh, this may be something that's um, timely. It may be overdue. Uh, but regardless, uh, Jesus talks about uh, this situation that we're living in. And so today's scripture uh, comes from Matthew chapter 14. And, uh, and so uh, let's look at this very familiar story from Matthew chapter 14. 
It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And, uh, and so you'll see in the beginning of this passage that Jesus goes off to a lonely place to pray. He goes off outside to, to pray. And um, it says that the, the, these fishermen, these disciples were fishing all night um, uh, between three and 6 a.m. So uh, they've been fishing all night. And of course, they were exhausted. And so when you're exhausted, you are going to be primed uh, with fear. Um, you're going to not be thinking straight. You're not going to be perceiving straight. You're not able to see things clearly. And so when they saw Jesus out in the water, of course, they were uh, anxious and afraid and freaking out. But I love the, the words of Jesus when he, uh, when he knows that this is what the disciples are experiencing, right? I don't know how he knew that, you know, maybe they're screaming, um, but regardless, he knew that this was what they were going through and experiencing. And so he says, take courage, it is I. And in the Greek, it is I, is ego and me, which in the Greek is translated as I am. And if you were with us during the, the Names of Jesus series, it's the same I am when uh, God speaks to Moses in Exodus at the burning bush. Uh, excuse me, not the burning bush, but I am who I am. And so we talked about the names of Jesus, whatever you need, I am. And so Jesus here in this episode says the same thing to his disciples. Take courage. Do not be afraid. I am I am who I am, ego and me. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the uh, habit of being a non-anxious presence. The habit of being a non-anxious presence. I heard a talk given by Pastor John Mark Comer, and he, he spoke uh, to, to my personal journey for the past three years or so. And I love his books. I love his insight. And just like the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Journey by Pete Scazzaro, shows us how to live a healthier spiritual life. This talk articulated the very things in my heart that I was facing. It articulated the journey that, that we as a community are experiencing. He talks about spiritual formation and transformation in such a tangible way. So much of this content is based on that talk. And he introduces us to uh, Edwin Freeman, who wrote a book called The Failure of Nerve. And Edwin Freeman is a Jewish rabbi and a therapist, and his expertise is in uh, family systems theory, which simply just means it's uh, how relationships function within a system. That's what family systems theory is. Uh, he became a very sought out advisor uh, for the White House. He became very well known and, and one of the top in his field. And in this book, um, the, the Failure of Nerve, the basic premise is that the West is built around this myth of progress, meaning that, that the West has faith that human history is moving towards a better utopia. Whereas ancient and Eastern societies, they view history as cyclical, like, like seasons. And so the West view of history is far more linear and the Eastern view of history is far more cyclical. And Friedman goes on to say that if you look at the, the raw data objectively, you will see that the West is, in fact, progressing economically and technologically and medicine, and it, it is at an all-time high. But unfortunately, the West is regressing emotionally and relationally. And I mean, if you, you could see that with your own eyes, that yes, we are progressing economically and technologically and medically. Um, but if you were to see with your own eyes that we are regressing in terms of our emotional health and, and just relationships in general, we become a lot more isolated. And Generation Z is now marked by this epidemic of anxiety. Um, Gen Z is going to be known, their characteristic is known by 
by anxiety. Um, and so mental health on, on colleges and universities is now a global problem. And mental health in our churches and in our church communities is also a growing epidemic. When we look at the story in Matthew chapter 14, uh, if you've re read Matthew from the beginning, from chapter 1 to chapter 14, you'll realize that this is the second story of Jesus and a storm. You might be like, wait a second, didn't we read this before? In fact, in chapter 8 is another story of the storm. It's very similar, right? Both stories are about storms. Both stories are on the Sea of Galilee. Both stories are at night. Uh, but in the first story in chapter 8, Jesus is inside the boat. And in the second story here, he is outside of the boat. And in the first story, if you're familiar with that story, uh, the storms come and, and, and Jesus speaks to the storm and, and calms the storm and the disciples are amazed and they're like, who has this ability to calm the storms and obey the word? Um, and so in that first story, Jesus says, why are you afraid? But in the second story, in this second story, he commands them, do not be afraid, take courage. And in the first story, um, if you remember, Jesus calls them, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And um, in fact, in the Greek, there is no preposition, you of little faith. It's, it's, there's no preposition, meaning it's you little faith. It's like a, a loving little nickname. Um, so it's saying, hey, you, uh, an affectionate term, you little faith. You know, in, in Korean, we kind of ha have this idea of, you know, majashik, you know, jashik, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of this term of endearment. In fact, um, just growing up in a bicultural house, I was always confused. I thought my parents were always mad at me. And, and later in my adult life, did I learn that, that phrase, you know, jashig is actually a term of endearment. I had to, I just uh, learned that and separate that, that they're not actually cursing me. They're actually, it's a term of endearment. And so a lot of times when we read that passage uh, in Matthew, it's, it, we, we see it as a condemning sort of, um, phrase or, or, or name that Jesus calls the disciples, but in fact, it's not. It's, it's, it's more of a loving, like, hey, you f little faith, you know, why did you doubt? And so you see these two stories, and you'll see a progression here. Um, the first story, we, we see the lesson is that, that you just can't wake up in the morning and just be this non-anxious person, right? Um, you know, you can't say, you know what, today, I, I'm just going to be a less nervous person today. It, it, it doesn't work. There's this progression that happens that Jesus um, starts with, you know, uh, why are you afraid? And it moves to don't be afraid. Um, and uh, Comer says that, and I, I love what he says, he says that we have to become through our apprenticeship to Jesus, the kind of people who are free of fear, and are a non anxious presence to others, to our spouses, to our parents, to our children, to our co workers. I love the fact that he uses the phrase that through our apprenticeship to Jesus, that uh, uh, the kind of people we become are people who are free of fear and we become a non-anxious presence. If that speaks to anybody, somebody say amen. So if we're being apprenticed with Jesus, how do we become that non-anxious presence? Well, in Friedman's book, he identifies a five-step cycle of perpetuating anxiety. And it are, is, are these five. It is reactivity, it is hurting instinct, it is blame displacement, it is quick fix mentality, and a lack of well differentiated leadership. Let me read that again. It's reactivity, it's hurting instinct, blame displacement, quick fix mentality, and a lack of well differentiated leadership. And so these are five uh, components that perpetuate our cycle of anxiety. And so let me talk about uh, reactivity first. You know this very well, especially in this political cycle. It, reactivity is this vicious, vicious cycle um, that is kicked off by the reactivity where people react to certain external uh, events of life and they react with anxiety and anger and fear. And so we now live in a 24 hour news cycle that thrives off of this reactivity it's a, it's a news uh, production and business that's looking for more hits to drive up advertising revenue so that they can ma make money. They, in fact, make money off of our anxiety, and they make money off of our addiction to our phones. And so you'll notice that how many journalists are now writing articles based on a few tweets on Twitter. 
And they're just reacting to tweets in order to feed this outrage mas machine, this, this monster to make money off of us. And, and we are reacting off of tweets and, and society is reacting off of these tweets. And so we have become a culture of reactivity that whenever someone says something, we react to, to it with, with anxiety and anger and fear. Um, and so the next step is hurting instinct. And, and we, we, whether we like it or not, we, we have this instinct to herd together, to follow the crowd, to, to be a part of this mob mentality which in fact reinforces our fear and anxiety. And so we, we have this uh, hurting instinct that, you know what, the, the other side, the left is gonna destroy us and, and make us communist. Or we say the right has already destroyed us and killed hundreds of thousands of people. And so we, we, we become a part of this mob, we become a part of this herd. And so now we have to ask yourselves, how do you expect to escape anger and anxiety when we are part and following this mob of hate. These are just natural components that we're a part of, which next then leads to blame shifting or blame displacement. And so instead of searching for the underlying causes of this toxicity, we fall into uh, being a victim or, or falling into victim status and we blame the other, which in fact results in paralysis for us, that we're just so stuck in, in blaming others that it just prevents understanding, it, it prevents uh, healing, it, it prevents uh, reconciliation. You know, we will we'll blame others for uh, the problems in our lives, we'll blame others for the problems in our world. It's, it, it's my parents who screwed me over, it's, it's my boss at work that is at fault, it's, it's, it's whatever, we'll just put the blame on someplace else. And then that moves into this desire to have a quick fix mentality it's, it's simply instant gratification. And, and because of technology, we, we are, are just now just drawn to a quick fix because of text messaging and, and DMs, direct messaging. And I, I'm scared personally because I see a lack of impulse control in our, in our teenagers when it comes to, to, to messaging. And unfortunately, a lot of it is because they're in quarantine, they have restricted access to their friends. And, and, uh, um, and so, so every little notification on their device, like I, I see them, they have to respond immediately. Like, remember the days when, when we had email and uh, what was acceptable was a 24 hour turnaround response. And even before email, we had snail mail, like literal like letters. And what was acceptable was a three to five business day response, right? Now it's like, I texted you five seconds ago. How come you're not responding to me? Right? This, is, this is what uh, our technology is, is causing us to, to, to crave and expect uh, uh, immediate responses. And because of this, it, it causes a low threshold of, of pain, which, which keeps us from what the writers of the Bible talks about, uh, perseverance, which is endurance inspired by hope. I love that definition, perseverance, which is inspired, uh, which is endurance inspired by hope. And because of this quick fix, it, it makes us look for a silver bullet, this, this quick, easy fix for, in fact, a very uh, long-term, complex, very difficult problems in our lives. And the emotional resilience of, of Generation Z, based on the, on the scholarship and based on the research and the data, the emotional resilience of Gen Z is now at its lowest point in human history. And finally, number five, there's, there's this lack of well-differentiated leadership uh, of where there's a, a leader where um, he or she has clear boundaries of this is me and that is you. See, because we are relational beings, it's, it's just so natural that when, when we're upset, um, that if you're upset, then, then I become upset. And if, if someone else is unhappy, then, then we're unhappy. And when someone else is worried, then we're worried. Um, and, and when someone smiles at you, we, we smile back. I mean, that's just how we're wired. But when we are not well differentiated and when our emotions are determined by someone else's emotions, that's in fact called codependency. But a well differentiated person is someone who experiences another person's emotions and is able to separate that and saying, that is you and this is me. 
And when they're able to differentiate themselves, they, they, they can approach that person with a calm sense of compassion and loving empathy. And we see Jesus doing that all the time. But Friedman says that to, in order to stop this cycle of anxiety, that we have to inject in the cycle what he calls a non-anxious presence. Someone who is at peace with God, who's at peace with himself, that that is you and this is me. And so I'm here, I'm present, I'm not sucked in into all of that anxiety or outrage. I'm here to offer a calm, non-anxious presence presence. And this is the kind of leader I, I want to be. And this is the kind of leader that I want to, this is what I want to pursue. And so this is a game changer for me personally in my spiritual uh, formation, in my, in my maturity. But you are also leaders. You are leaders in your home. You may be leaders in your workplace. And you may be experiencing that. And that's the only way to break this cycle, whether it be at home or at church or at work or even as a nation. Because we're seeing cancel culture just going totally out of control. The, the reactivity and the, the hurting instinct uh, of the left or the right and the blame shifting is just is out of control. And so instead of a non-anxious presence saying, look, this is you, but, but here's me that I'm able to hear you with compassion and love for your difficulty, for your challenges, for your plight. Jesus was able to do that. I mean, do you see that in, in Jesus's life? He in fact wept with Mary and Martha. He had compassion on the sick and the ill, but he was not ruled by other people's anxiety. Just like the disciples, the disciples were freaking out and he was not ruled by their anxiety, but he was able to have compassion and he was able to offer a non-anxious presence and say, don't be afraid, take courage. Well, that sounds uh, easier uh, said than done, right? I, I wish I could say, all right, all right then, I'll just become a non-anxious presence from now on. You know, I, I wish it was that simple. But in fact, Jesus had some habits that allowed him to be this non-anxious presence. And the habits that come from Jesus, we have a slide, are these five things that we, we see in his life. And the habits of Jesus is slowing down, Sabbath rest, koinonia, or we understand it as community or fellowship, contemplative prayer, and freedom. These are the habits of Jesus, slowing down. Sabbath rest, koinonia or community, contemplative, contemplative prayer, and freedom. Um, I love Pete Scazzaro, uh, who, who uh, we study a lot through Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and he talks about a slow down spirituality, right? You'll notice that in the Gospels that Jesus was rarely ever in a hurried, he was, he was never frantic, he was never freaking out even though there are a lot of things around him that was worthy of freaking out. Dallas Willard uh, says that Jesus's pace of life is clearly much slower than our own. And I want you to think of how many stories in the gospels that are actual interruptions into what Jesus was doing. But then do you see how Jesus responds? He's not frantic, he's not hurried. C.S. Lewis said something to the effect of like, um, how you respond to interruptions is who you really are. And man, that is quite sobering, right? How we respond to interruptions is who, and if I were to look at my life and how I respond to interruptions, man, I, I, I don't do interruptions that well. But there's something about Jesus's soul where, where there was enough space in his life and there was a pace in his life where he would navigate through the world, even though he was so very busy, where he was open to interruptions, whereas often I am not very open to interruptions. I, I have my, my agenda, I have my, my plan, and I've got to move forward. But somehow Jesus was, was able to navigate enough space and enough pace in his life where he was open to the interruptions, even divine interruptions from, from the Father of what he wanted to, to do in, in Jesus's life. There's a Japanese theologian who wrote uh, Three Mile an Hour God. 
and he says that God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. Love has a speed. It has an inner speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are used to. And that leads us to, to the second habit is Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest. You'll notice in Jesus that there is a rhythm of retreat and return. Retreat and return. He goes away to spend some time in solitude and by himself, and then he returns to his busy life. And so there's this oscillation, this ry rhythm of retreating and tending to his soul, and then returning to do all his work and teaching and healing and doing the stuff. Do we have that kind of rhythm in our lives, or, or is it just simply just work, 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 work? Even in this passage, and in Luke chapter 5, it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Can that be said of us, that we withdraw and then go back to work? We withdraw and go back to work. It seems that the more demand that Jesus was, was on or having, the more he seemed to, snuck away to sneak away to pray and tend to his soul. The more demanding his agenda and his itinerary was, the more he went away to, to seek God and, and to pray and tend to his soul. And so for those of us in any form of leadership, leadership in the home, leadership at work, leadership at church, we naturally feel that we have to do more, we have to be more busy and we have to be more available and we have to uh, just be frantic in our work. We have to show people that, that we're, we're so busy. But what if the truth was that it's actually reversed? That the more responsible we are for things and the more influential you are, the more you actually need to rest and tend to your soul. Unfortunately, we've been hearing of so many church leaders, very significant church leaders and apologists falling into sexual sin. And if you look at their crazy busy itineraries, they're traveling and speaking all over the country, all over the world at conferences. And maybe, I don't know their lives, but maybe there's just very little attention to their souls and experiencing true rest in God because they were so busy. And maybe Jesus was just showing us his habits of how we actually need to live and what the consequences are if we don't live that way. At the very least, we're going to have nervous breakdowns and, and significant mental illnesses. Uh, in basketball, uh, there is a very controversial phenomenon called load management. Load management. And the basic idea is that the more important a player is to the team, the less they are able to play. I know it's, it's crazy, right? Load management, like the more important the player is to the team, the less they're able to play. See, because the controversy is that you pay tons of money, hundreds of dollars to, to go to a game. And um, well, before COVID, when we could actually go to games, but you pay lots of money to go to a game. And the star player is just sitting on the bench, resting his body. What is that? You're paying all this money for LeBron James to sit on the bench to rest his body. It's like, hey man, I'm not paying, you're not being paid to rest. But here's the concept. The more the player, the more important the player is, the more that they need to rest. And maybe that's true for you. Maybe you need life-giving renewal, whatever that looks like for you. The more busy you are, the more renewal you need in your life. And recently, I, I found that skiing uh, to be a recreational activity that renews me. I, I, for, for 30, 40 years, I had no idea of what activities or what things can replenish me and renew me. And I just recently, within maybe not until three years ago, that, that skiing is something that renews me. You, you need to find that activity um, for some, maybe it's golfing, or, or maybe it's going to the beach, or, or surfing, maybe it's hiking, or, or maybe it's driving on a trip, drawing, or, or playing music. Y you need to find that thing that, that, that replenishes you, that, that gives you uh, a rest. Gordon McDonald in his book, Ordering Your Private World, says, Jesus knew his limits well. Strange as it may seem, he knew what we conveniently, conveniently forget that time must be properly budgeted for the gathering of inner strength. That time must be properly budgeted for the gathering of inner strength. 
and resolve in order to compensate one's weaknesses when spiritual warfare begins. In other words, how well we rest will determine how well we work. And it'll determine how victorious we are against the enemy. Because when we're tired, when we're exhausted, we are so vulnerable to the enemy and to temptation. When we're uh, tempted with substances or when we're tempted with food or we're tempted to doom scroll on our phones or when we're tempted with sexual temptation, typically it's when our soul is empty, when our soul is exhausted. It's been said that um, rest is a weapon for spiritual warfare. Rest is a weapon for spiritual warfare. Sabbath, rest, sleep is a weapon that when we fight the enemy, it, it's a weapon. Sleep is a biblical principle. I know that so many of us, especially in our, our, our Western culture, that's like we got to work, 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 and, and, and sleep are for, for weak people and and, uh, you know, we try our best to survive on the least amount of sleep. Sleep is a biblical principle. I could do a whole message on the theology of sleep and how ancient Jews believe that when we sleep, God is at work. And it is a way that we put our trust in God and not ourselves. And when we sacrifice sleep, we, we communicate that we don't trust God to work. And so we take matters into our own hands. You know, I, I can see it now. I'm going to do part 12 in our series, The Habit of Sleep. And, and people will be like, amen, you know, <laughs> for the habit of sleep. But uh, but I digress there. But it's very difficult um, to be tempted when you are well-rested, when you're emotionally healthy, when you're happy people. But it's very easy to be tempted when you're exhausted, burnt out, workaholics, and under chronic stress. May I give you permission this morning to rest, to be able to rest. You have permission to rest, that you are not condemned and you are not judged on how busy and how frantic you are. You have permission to rest. Next, I want to talk about koinonia, or many of us know it as fellowship or uh, community. But this koinonia is this idea of this deep soul kind of friendship, this kindred spirit type of friendship. And unfortunately, the reality of, of our generation and and Gen Z and millennials is that we are lacking that kind of friendship. Jesus had that type of deep soul friendship with Peter, James, and John. He had that koinonia. It's, and, and we are built and wired to have this deep need for, for koinonia, especially when in partnership for the kingdom of God. And that's why life pods are are, are been so helpful for so many. It's because it's fulfilling that, that idea that, that in my soul, I have this need for connection, for someone to hear my heart, to someone to know my heart, to be able to, to receive someone's heart, to be able to, to come around and, and experience this deep soul connection through the center of Jesus Christ. And so that's a habit that Jesus had. Another habit that Jesus had as we uh, kind of move uh, quickly is that contemplative prayer. You know, that word contemplative prayer, that, that phrase, that idea, people Unfortunately, they kind of have a mixed reaction to this idea, depending on how you grew up in church. Um, we have kind of adverse kind of uh, reaction to contemplative prayer, especially if you grew up in a charismatic background. Uh, the introverts in the room are like, yes, contemplative prayer. Whereas the extroverts who are like committed to mission and evangelism and service, uh, they're typically allergic to this idea of contemplative prayer because there's a world that is dying out there and that needs to be saved. We, we don't have time for contemplative prayer. We've got we to gotta save the world. Well, you do have to wrestle with the idea that Jesus often withdrew to quiet places to be alone and to pray. Now, scripture doesn't tell us what kind of prayer it was. Um, but it, I mean, if you grew up in Korea in a large church, uh, there was no such thing as contemplative prayer, right? It, it was chuyo three times, chuyo, chuyo, just, just screaming your heart out, you know, and just, and, and, and that's how I grew up. There was no silence in prayer. It was move your mouth as fast as you can for 30 minutes nonstop, crying out to God, telling God everything in your heart and just going crazy and just, you know, going buck wild crazy in your prayer. There's no such thing as contemplative prayer in, in, in my background or history. But when Jesus says in John 15 to abide in me, I take that as, as resting in, in God's love, in, in the Father's love. And, um, 
And so there's a type of prayer that feels like work. And, and, and that's good and, and it's needed. We need to intercede and we need to, to, to travail after God and pursue God. And, and, um, but I, I think, unfortunately, that's the only type of prayer that, that we feel that we, ha- that we have to aspire to, that, that just nonstop working and praying and interceding type of prayer. And the irony is that, that when we're tired and when we're exhausted and we're burnt out, uh, we definitely feel like we need to pray more. But our understanding of prayer just sounds like so much work. And so I would suspect that that's why maybe we're reluctant to pray uh, on Saturday mornings because we have this image that, oh man, I know I got to pray, I got to pray, but it's just so much work to pray. And maybe it's because our understanding of prayer is work, but it's not abiding in God. It's not resting in his presence. It's not listening to his voice. It's not hearing his heart. It's not being covered and overwhelmed by his unconditional, unstopping love for us. That we have this idea that prayer is just work, 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 work. I love um, someone who said that prayer is relaxing in God's goodness. Prayer is relaxing in God's goodness. See, the ancient mystics, uh, they've said the opposite of contemplation is not action, but reaction that the opposite of contemplation is, is reaction or being reactive. And um, if you think about it, much of leadership is, is reactive. It's not, not contemplative, right? In leadership, what we do is we react to others. We react to criticisms. We react to complaints. We react to the tyranny and urgence. We react to all the emails in our inbox. Uh, leadership is, is, unfortunately, a lot of it is reaction. But true leadership that Jesus demonstrated is pausing, it's resting, it's hearing from God for a sense of direction, and then stepping back into the world in action and activity. And finally, uh, the last habit I want to talk about is, is freedom. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're free. Um, the freedom that we feel is the freedom on an emotional level uh, for this need that our lives have to, to go a certain direction or or our life has to, to go a certain way for us to be happy and to be at peace. I mean, let's be honest, right? Uh, we have a plan for our own lives and, and we can be happy and we can be at peace if it goes the way that we want it to do. But freedom is, is this idea that we can let go, that, uh, that our lives need to go a certain way for us to be happy and to be at peace. It's this idea of, of yieldedness, that the simple idea that whatever God gives us, that we're okay. That we're not emotional stoics, that yes, we, we allow the emotional uh, negative emotions to go through us and we feel them, but our sense of joy, our sense of peace is not dependent on my life needs to go this way. Um, so that our joy and peace co- doesn't come from uh, external things, but it comes from, from Christ who is in us, who gives us a peace that surpasses understanding, that Jesus is our anchor. And so when Jesus says, do not be afraid or do not fear, he's not saying that bad things won't happen to you. Because look at Jesus's life. Look at, look at what happens to him. He goes to the cross. But what he is saying is that even in death, even in all the worst circumstances, even at the cross, do not be afraid, for I have conquered death. I have conquered the worst of the worst. I have conquered the worst that can ever happen. So you don't need to be afraid. Can a brother get an amen? And so there are two ways that we can deal with anxiety. Number one, uh, which is the most common route, is that we can do our best to fix every problem that we have and fix all of the problems that we have so that we'll have nothing to worry about nothing to be anxious about, right? Good luck with that one, right? For those of us who choose that route, we're just, we're just chasing after the wind and, and life becomes this endless game of, of whack-a-mole, right? Here's a problem, I fix it. Here's another problem. And we're just chasing all these problems and we're trying to fix it. That's one way to deal with it. Or the second way that we can deal it is that we can come to a place where Jesus is our peace, where Jesus is our rest, where we can come to a place where we are okay with our situation. I'm not saying be passive or, or don't care about your, your troubles or, or don't be non-emotional. But what I'm saying is that 
whatever that we we are doing whatever we can do but even if it's not fixed then it's okay because christ has conquered death that christ is the victor out of all of this that he has a plan for our lives <clears throat> you know um as a, as a parent um i i found that up uh, I found out that now as my child is growing up to a preteen stage, I have to be honest, um, I have in fact more fear and more anxiety going into this next stage of his life um, because there's so much, uh, so much to actually be worried about, I, I suppose. Uh, you know, what is he, uh, you know, wh what is he going through and what is he um, getting his hands into and, and what is his um, being exposed to, you know, and, um, when I, when I respond to a comment or behavior uh, with anxiety, then, then I become, personally, I become this monster tyrant who grounds my kid for any little thing, right? Um, because of my fear and anxiety, I, I just clamp down and I become this, this control freak. And it's like, you know, maybe he'll ask like, dad, can you unlock the iPad? I'm like, why? No, you're grounded. Or it's like, Dad, can I um, can I chat online with my friends? And I'm like, Why? What are you up to? No, you're grounded again, right? And so, that's that's no way I want to live, and that's that's not the way that we want to live. Being a non anxious presence doesn't mean I'm going to chill out, but it, it means that I'm going to be fully present, being free and present to you. A recent survey said, survey said that, that there's only 15% of our lives that we can actually control. Think about that. There's only 15% of our, our lives that we are actually under our control. And if you hear a, a statistic like that, that, that should give you some freedom. Because unfortunately, we, we feel like we can control 80% of our lives. And because only 10% is under control, that we have a 70% gap that we have to try to fix and, and stress out about. But that's not the reality. That, that there's only 15% that we can control and the rest is out of our control. And if we can accept that reality and trust the Lord that he watches over us, then we can experience freedom for our souls. This message is, is really personal for me because uh, I have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And um, I can't say that I am naturally a non-anxious presence. Uh, a non-anxious presence doesn't mean that we're never going to be afraid. Uh, in fact, fear is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a signal from your body that something is a threat, right? If there's a bird that's flying at your head and you flinch, right? That's your body doing what it's supposed to do. It's not because you're an immature man. Th that's normal. And so being a non-anxious presence doesn't mean that you're not afraid anymore. It means that you fear God. And because you fear God, that brings peace to everything. They say that inner healing is the removal of anxiety and fear of what you cannot control. The inner healing is the removal of anxiety and fear of what you cannot control. That I'm okay when life is not okay. And we don't have to be scared of death because Jesus has overcome death. And we don't have to be afraid of death. And so that is the invitation from Jesus to you. And for some of you, this journey will be a lot easier. But if you're like me, this will be a lifelong journey of surrendering to God, to developing a rhythm of, of withdrawal and return, withdrawal and return. And so my prayer is that may God set you free from this vicious cycle of anxiety as we navigate through the rest of 2021. May you see the importance and value of rest and Sabbath, of creating margin for your lives to tend to your soul. And may God make you a non-anxious presence before him. So let's pray together. Lord, as much as our world and our circumstances are so busy and chaotic, Lord, our soul is so chaotic right now. Lord, there's so many worries and fears and uncertainty that we have. We have no guarantee, except the only guarantee that we have is that you are with us, that you are for us, that you've overcome the grave, that nothing can overcome you, that, that you are our cornerstone, that you are a rock, that you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so, Lord, we don't fear our circumstances, but we fear you. 
Lord, we honor you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, help us to abide in you. Help us to, to create that space and that pace and that margin so that we can experience you. Lord, we just need you right now. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, thank you and help us to be a non-anxious presence in our homes, in our workplaces, in our churches. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's respond and let's, uh, let's worship and let's sing about how it's God's grace that holds us. It is all about his grace that covers all of us. So let's, let's, let's sing the song together. Sometimes I'm weak, sometimes I fall in my wandering, but through it all, there's just one thing more precious than the air I breathe. Grace, amazing grace, unfair. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Pastor Eugene, for uh, that great challenge and reminder uh, to find our rest in Jesus. I'm looking forward to your uh, sermon on the habit of sleep. I'm looking forward to that one. That's going to be a good one. <laughs> um, but uh, in response to God's goodness and uh, his blessing, 
Uh, let's turn now to our time of offering and, um, you know, resting and trusting in God. A lot of that involves our finances. And uh, I've personally found that when we give, when we surrender uh, in our giving to the Lord, it's just a, a real practical way to sort of just trust the Lord to take care of us and, and at the same time advance his kingdom. So let's go ahead and uh, let's give unto God. We've uh, set up a few ways for you to do that online through our website, cgracelife.com slash give. Uh, you can text 84321, or you can also give um, through our church center app as well. Uh, so go ahead and let's go ahead and give unto the Lord uh, this morning. And um, I'll bring us back together in a moment and we'll pray together. Let me uh, bring us back together. Um, we've made giving so easy that hopefully you were able to do that uh, in that brief time. Uh, let me go ahead and pray uh, as we receive our tithes and offerings. Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for just the gift of rest in Christ. Lord, um, we know our souls so often are full of uh, chaos and stress and anxiety. But Lord, you are our peace. You are our comfort. You are our joy. And so we want to just abide once again in you, Lord, and uh, we give you these tithes and offerings as a way of trusting you, but also as a way of expanding um, the kingdom to others, that they may experience the rest in Christ that you promise. And so we ask that you take these gifts and use it for your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, before we close the service, I want to just highlight some important announcements as we end uh, the month of February. The first is, if you're a guest, uh, we, we hope that you were uh, encouraged by today's service. Uh, we'd love to serve you by getting you important resources and updates. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and let us know you, you came and text new to the number 818-722-2124. Uh, we promise not to spam your inbox, but only get you important information and updates. And so go ahead and take a moment uh, to do that and let us know uh, you were part of the service today. Also, um, you can text to that same number, any prayer requests that you have, and we would love to pray for you and cover you in prayer. Uh, just knowing that people are praying for you can help you have peace and, and experience God's rest. So we want to invite you to, to reach out. You can also do that during the week on our website, uh, cgracelife.com. There's a link for prayer requests as well. And we want to invite you to join us also Saturday mornings uh, for our 714 prayer meetings based off of that great promise of 2 Chronicles 714. And as Pastor G mentioned in um, his message, uh, our 714 prayer meetings, um, you know, they're different every week. Uh, but one thing that they're great at is reminding us to abide and rest in Jesus. And we do that as a community. And uh, it's very refreshing. And it, it's, you know, it doesn't feel like just tons of work. In fact, it's a great community that we've developed, and we invite, invite you to be part of that. And so we'd love to see you uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, also, I want to just uh, highlight uh, that we um, want to be able to uh, invite you to the Church Center app if you haven't uh, been part of that. Uh, this is very important, especially as uh, Life Parts are uh, participating and, and starting this week. Uh, so get the Church Center app. Uh, it's where we get a lot of important resources out to you, including our Life Pod materials. And speaking of Life Pods, uh, if um, you're part of one, you should have received uh, communication this week from us about the Life Pod that you're in and the fact that we're starting up this week. If you didn't receive a communication, um, it may, it may have been an oversight or maybe um, just somehow you're overlooked. We will apologize for that if you're expecting to be part of a life pod but didn't receive a communication. So please, please reach out to us uh, by texting the, the 818 number, or you can email Pastor Eugene at eugene at cgracelife.com, and we'll get you on track to becoming part of 
uh, the life pods this season. Uh, and lastly, um, as we approach uh, the tax deadline for um, 2020, uh, if you'd like to receive a receipt for uh, claiming your deductions from giving, just email finance at cgracelife.com and we'll be happy to get that to you. So let me go ahead and pass it back over to Pastor Eugene for the closing benediction. My prayer this week is that uh, we would know that uh, life doesn't get any easier. It doesn't um, slow down unless we uh, create margin in our lives to uh, be with the Lord. And so uh, let me bless you uh, this, this week. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace for those who surrender uh, to, to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have, have a great um, Sabbath today and, and just enjoy this week. And uh, I want to encourage you to stick around and, and catch up and say hello. Uh, otherwise, have a great uh, Sunday and uh, we'll have a great week. We'll see you again.